One might think that the universe would have granted the Fowl Twins a moment's respite, considering all they had endured at the hands of Acronym. But no, it was not finished meddling with the brothers just yet. The boys closed the steel door on one episode and opened the throttle on another. The throttle being connected to the dashboard of a high-powered, shallow-draft, rigid-hull inflatable boat, or RIB, which had been most conveniently docked outside the black site in a sunken dock. Beckett, with his instinctive understanding of mechanics, flooded the sunken dock as though he had been worked with canal locks all his life, and soon the RIB was surging toward open water. Beckett overcame the fact that the salt-crusted windshield impeded his view by standing on the wheel and steering with his feet while he leaned his chest against the plexiglass. This one little action was actually a very accurate snapshot of his entire personality. For perhaps a single minute, the progress was smooth and unchallenged, and Miles used this time to open a dialogue with the fairy creature sitting opposite him. I haven't introduced myself, he said, attempting to smooth back his hair which, he remembered too late, now lay on the floor of the wet room. I know who you are, said Lazuli, and it must be said that her tone was quite sullen for someone who had just escaped almost certain experimentation on her person by creepy people with scalpels. I don't know why you helped me. Miles tapped the arm of his spectacles. Artemis told me to. Your face unlocked a series of video messages. Nani's facial recognition software was apparently programmed to recognize fairy physiognomy. Here, Miles paused and smiled to emphasize the fact that he was about to make a hilarious and ice-breaking joke. Or perhaps I should say, physio no me Miles waited for a laugh that never materialized. Were you attempting humor? asked Lazuli. My command of your language is unsophisticated, so perhaps you were making a joke. Or perhaps you were just culturally insensitive. Miles decided that the best course of action was to ignore the question entirely. I helped you on the helicopter because I sensed you were an ally. Artemis has often told us stories of fairies, and in those tales, the people are always the heroes. The good guys, if you will. And why did you help me in this terrible underground place? We helped each other, said Miles. And I feel our best hope of survival is to continue working together, as a team. Beckett picked up on the word team. Can we use our team name, the Regrettables? He adopted a movie trailer voice. Can they help you? They're not sure because they are the regrettables. Lazuli frowned. Is this another joke? Unfortunately, no, said Miles. Beckett does not joke about team names. To summarize a long story, once Artemis was experimenting with vaccines and we contracted the chickenpox, so Beck dubbed us the regrettables because we were in no shape to help anyone. For a split second, Lazuli seemed a little less dour. The Regrettables. I like this name. Miles picked up on the minute softening of the Blue Fairy's attitude and extended a hand. I am, as you know, Master Miles Fowl. That exuberant fellow is my twin, Beckett. And you would be? Lazuli took the hand and turned it over, examining it. I would be Specialist Heights of the Lower Elements Police. Miles thoroughly approved of formal introductions. There would be time enough to get to know each other later. Excellent, Specialist Heights. I have no doubt we can concoct a plan to evade the clutches of Sister Geronima and her lackeys. Lazuli released Miles' hand. You seem very calm, Master Fowl, for someone who has just discovered that fairies actually exist. I am generally calm, explained Miles. Only the tiniest of minds cannot accept the improbable. I think a part of me always suspected you existed. Artemis confirmed my suspicions, and you confirmed Artemis' statements. Living proof, as they say. Can you show me this video of your brother, the famous Artemis Fowl? Of course, said Miles. You will need to don my spectacles. But before there could be any donning of spectacles, Beckett Crab walked across the steering wheel, banking the inflatable sharply left down a smaller canal. We're being followed, he said excitedly. By whom? asked Miles. Ask me like we're in a game, said his twin. Miles sighed. <sighs> Who dares follows the regrettables? Baker took a quick look around. Three Zodiac powered both behind us. Lazuli scanned the canal bank ahead and saw two black SUVs surging along the narrow street, heeding neither pedestrians nor speed limits. Two vehicles on land, 
she said. Miles tapped and held a sensor on the arm of his spectacles, putting Nani on speaker. Nani, an escape route, if you please. The artificial intelligence synced with the weather satellite and hijacked a bird's eye feed of the city. Escape not really in the cards, she said. The power boats are herding us toward the automobiles. We're like chickens in a chicken run. We need to get off this canal, said Lazuli. Unfortunately, not going to happen, said Nani. At this speed, we cannot make the turn. To set the scene, picture, if you will, early morning Amsterdam. The city is shrugging off the shadows of night and preparing itself for the hordes of tourists who will shortly throng its streets and waterways. The canals are quiet, but for the occasional party boat crew assessing the damage from the previous night's revelries and swabbing the crafts of the various forms of viscous bile congealing on the decks. A few mammoth dredger boats were fishing bicycles from the canals. The majority of these had been dumped by casual thieves. It's estimated that if all the bikes stolen in Amsterdam in a single year were laid out front wheel to back wheel, the bike train would reach the moon. The architectural marvel that is the Maritime Museum stands solidly on its artificial island, supported by almost 2,000 wooden piles sunk deep into the mud, delaying sunrise over the old harbor by several minutes with its bulk. This is all very well and good, you say, but what about our heroes? Just how desperate is their situation? It can be described best as a mathematical problem, such as one might find on a high school exam. If the regrettable boat, designated A, is traveling north at 50 knots on Western Canal toward open water, how long before the acronym crafts, designated B, C, and D, traveling at 68 knots, close to the 200-yard gap? Other factors include the two SUVs now parked on the canal 400 yards ahead of boat A, and the dredger currently blocking the canal. If boat A continues on its course, its progress will be halted by the dredger, and the occupants will be surrounded, making capture inevitable. There is an escape route involving a turn starboard down a narrow canal, Zutgeiskerkacht, but the deceleration involved to make the turn without flipping boat A would result in boats C B, C, and D overtaking boat A. Turning at this speed would result in capsizing, so I must reluctantly conclude that escape is improbable, said Nani on speaker. I say reluctantly because I think I like you guys, but at least if you are all killed, I will be proven right. It seemed to Miles that Nani was not all the way there when it came to interpersonal relationships. But then again, he thought, <laughs> neither have I. Perhaps there are factors I am unaware of, said Nani. Do we, by any chance, have any rocket launchers? Lazuli checked an equipment locker in the stern. No rocket launchers, a portable battering ram, and some Kevlar vests? We must turn right, said Miles. Yet we must not decelerate. The solution to their problem came from an unexpected quarter, i.e. Beckett, who did not, as a rule, provide solutions for Miles' problem because, like most siblings, he enjoyed watching his brother squirm. But this time there was daring do involved, so Beckett made an exception. We need a leopard, he announced, backflipping from his porch on the wheel, which was a total showboat move as he could have simply stepped down. Miles was not as aghast at this frankly ridiculous suggestion as one might expect. After all, he had a long history of being on the receiving end of Beckett's notions. A leper, he asked with some patronizing kindness. Perhaps the sinking will be left to me. No offense, brother. You think, said Beckett. I'll do. And with that, the erstwhile blonde twin swung himself over the starboard side, straining to keep his body rigid against the canal water while clinging to the gunwale ropes. Turn, brother he said through gritted teeth, the water sluicing over his gleaming head. Miles understood then. Ah, you meant to say Lieber, not Leper. That was a most untimely confusion because... Turn, brother, gurgled Beckett. Hard starboard. Lazuli, though her first language was not English, grasped what the hyperactive human was attempting and grabbed the steering wheel, spinning it clockwise. The rib skipped sideways, its rubber hull whistling with each bounce and one propeller of its twin engines actually breaking the surface and whining in discontent. Miraculously, Beckett's improvised human stabilizer righted the craft, and it shot down Zatkigracht with barely a graze against the canal wall, but enough of a graze to do some damage. 
The first two Zodiacs on their tail did not have an inspired 11-year-old among their crew, and so failed to make the turn. They gave it the good old Special Forces try, but succeeded only in piling into each other on the bend. The first was shredded by the propellers of the second, rendering both boats useless. The third craft coughed a lucky bounce and found itself, through no expertise on the part of the pilot, still in the chase. Beckett's Lee Bird was a resounding success, and so the twin relaxed his body and allowed the current to flip him neatly inside the boat. The entire thing was an Olympic-level feat of agility, and Miles could not resist a smug celebration on his brother's behalf, which took the form of a salute toward the acronym agents lined between the iron dock posts on shore, posturing like angry but ultimately helpless gorillas. Beckett shook himself like the proverbial hound and then turned to his brother. What next, brother? That was my idea for this week. We need to make for the harbor, said Miles. Beckett laughed. <laughs> That's easy. Just steer into the harbor. We're punctured, said Lazuli. The boat will not sink, but she'll be unwieldy and sluggish in a matter of minutes. As it turned out, minutes would have been a luxury, as the remaining acronym craft drew level and the pilot ordered them to stop or be fired upon. We can't stop, said Lazuli. Bad things will happen to all of us, to all my people. I cannot allow that, said Miles. Beckett patted his brother on the head, which was most patronizing, even in these circumstances. Think not, fellow regrettable. Thinking only slows us down. Miles' eyes widened as he correctly guessed what Beckett intended to do. No, don't! Too late, said Beckett. I already have. Which was patently untrue, but seemed to Beckett like the kind of thing an adventurer might say. Beckett made a monkey leap between the boats and dished out half a dozen cluster punches, neutralizing almost an entire crew of acronym agents before they had time to do much more than furrow their brows. Although one quick-thinking fellow did take a swipe at Beckett with a baton, but all he managed to make contact with was the powerboat's rubber keel, which bounced the baton back with on his own forehead, saving Beckett the trouble of paralyzing him. Don't do it! But by then, Beckett was already back on board. You are reckless, brother! said Miles. Someday your luck will run out. I doubt the humans will fall for that trick again, commented Lazuli, keeping one eye on the black vehicles mirroring their progress down the canal. I agree, said Miles. The next time we encounter acronym agents, they'll be sporting knee pads. Go right here, then take the next left. That will put us in the harbor and out of reach. It was a short-term plan, to be sure, but Miles needed to buy some time so he could review Artemis's message. Somewhere in there, he felt sure that there would be vital information. Nani interrupted his train of thought. Should I contact your parents, Master Miles? They will be worried about you. Absolutely not, Nani, he said. Mother's and father's communications are doubtless being monitored just as the villa was. We are on our own for the moment. Not exactly, said Lazuli, nodding toward the main station, which ran ferries across the distinctive I Film Museum. The first ferry of the morning was loading cars and passengers for transfer across the harbor. But it seemed the acronym vehicles were not prepared to wait, for they crashed through the barriers and drove straight into the water. All very well and good for the Fowl Twins, one might think, but the SUVs refused to sink as they had been reasonably expected to do. Instead, the automobiles sprouted foils and powered across the open water. A large cheer rose from the ferry crowd as though they were bearing witness to some kind of entertainment, which, in a way, they were. Oh dear, said Miles. Amphibious craft. I suppose it is only to be expected from such a well-funded organization. Specialist Height's arrowhead markings glowed a fiercer shade of yellow than usual, a sure sign of her anxiety. I was supposed to be swiping av avatars today, she said, relieved that her high collar covered most of her arrowheads. Not dodging legions of murderous humans. It's time to for drastic measures, said Miles. I was hoping to avoid this. Beckett liked the sound of the word drastic, and also the fact that Miles was now prepared to do something he had been hoping to avoid. What do you mean by drastic, brother? His twin did not have time to explain. You did say there was a bot turn around in the equipment locker specialist heights. I did, said Lazuli. Portable and pneumatic. Fetch it, brother mine, said Miles, for I must batter something. Beckett felt as though his head might explode from sheer joy. This adventure just kept getting better and better!
There is a renegade school of architecture based on the idea that there are more factors governing the stability of a structure than is commonly believed. More traditional architects agree that any building can be toppled by extremes of weather, shoddy construction, everyday wear and tear, and perhaps more insidious factors such as airborne sulfur dioxide, sulfates, nitrogen oxides, and nitrates. But these factors do not explain the dozens of structures that collapse every day for no apparent reason. That's where anarchitecture comes in, the architecture of anarchy. An architecture was first proposed as a science by the Irish prodigy Artemis Fowl II and was elaborated upon by his younger sibling, Miles Fowl, when he snuck into his older brother's lecture at Trinity College and heckled him from the audience. Miles found Artemis' theories laughably simplistic and took it upon himself to write a more comprehensive thesis and beam it to his brother in space, finishing his message with the old Latin initialism QED, which usually means quod erat demonstratium, or thus as has been shown but which Miles adapted to stand for quite elementary, dear brother. The basic premise of an architecture is as follows. There are many more factors affecting the soundness of a building than previously suspected. These include the rotation and orbit of the earth, cosmic gravitational influences, magnetic fields, water and tide levels, ley lines, the curvature of the planet, solar flares, atmospheric radiation, tectonic shifts, the design of the building itself, the spirituality levels of the population, the diets and emissions of local mammals, and the density of dance venues in the area. According to Miles' calculations, there were over a thousand major structures, including complexes and even whole towns in Europe, that were on the tipping point of collapse, and could, with only a single added factor, one day be either partially or completely demolished. So Miles, in all good conscience, had sent a copy of his list of sites at, to the board members of each complex, and for his trouble was either ignored or ridiculed. One reason for this scoring was his hypothetical situation that if the chorus line of Riverdance danced in Piazza de San Marco at a rate of 25 taps per second for 17 minutes, the entire city of Venice would sink into the Adriatic. However, all those who had scoffed at an architecture were about to have their scoff stuffed down their throats, for Miles was now intent on proving his theories in spectacular fashion. One of the more anarchitecturally susceptible buildings on his list was Amsterdam's Striking Eye Film Museum, which Miles had positively pestered with warning emails, all of which had been met with polite automatic responses. But if Miles' calculations were correct, then it should be possible for him to both vindicate his reputation and buy the regrettables a little time. Currently, Beckett was pleading with his brother for permission to deploy the battering ram. Commando mem, be bam bam, he said, speaking in foul argot, hoping the familiarity would sway Miles. Commando being how the toddler twins used to say, come on, or please. I'm sorry, brother mine, said Miles firmly. We have only one chance, and the blow must be struck it with pinpoint accuracy. I am pinpoint, argued Beckett. Don't you see those cluster punches? Humans and buildings follow different rules, said Miles. You do have a certain undeniable instinct with biological forms, but buildings must be left to me. Lazuli stood behind the brothers with the battering ram resting heavily across her collarbone. She felt more exposed than she ever had been, and this was, in fact, the correct way for specialist heights to feel as an unshielded fairy in a European city with a growing crowd across the water waiting for the morning fairy. Humans! she snapped. Get to it! These amphibious craft are dangerously close! Of course, specialist, said Miles. My apologies. He tapped the arm of his spectacles. Nani, using my art and architecture algorithms, mark the nexus of catastrophe with a laser. Beckett elbowed Lazuli. The nexus of catastrophe? That's so Miles. That's like Miles' entire life right there. Even Nani was doubtful. Of course, Miles, said the AI. But you do know, don't you, that it can never succeed. Artemis only invented the science of an architecture to keep you from discovering his real work. Miles shook his head. Poor Artemis. I feel sorry for him, really, with his cloning and space rockets. Well, I'm about to prove him and the entire scientific community wrong. Miles smirked. Which I predict will become a quite common occurrence. Lazuli rolled the battering ram off her shoulder. I'm just gonna set this off and hope. No, said Miles. This is a delicate experiment. Accuracy is paramount. A laser shot out of Miles' spectacles and quickly scorched a circle on the stone above their heads 
A circle with exactly the same radius as the battering ram's business end. Very well, Miles, said Nani. But it is my duty as your protector to say that I think you are squandering this opportunity to escape. We shall see, said Miles. Now, if you please, Specialist Heights, the battering ram. The scorched circle was above the regrettable's head height in the slanted underside of the Eye Film Museum's white stone. The museum was a futuristic and deservedly famous landmark perched at the waterside of the IJ Promenade. It could be described as a cross between a kaiju cricket and the solidified speed trails of a rocket booster. The main structure sat atop a giant plinth that operated at the building's lobby and restaurant, or would operate as such in a few hours when the institute opened for business. But for the moment, the only beings in the environs were the mixed species group that we shall continue to refer to as the Regrettables for the sake of convenience. The amphibious acronym vehicles were powering across the harbor, and only be a matter of half a minute before they reached dry land, at which point it seemed fairly certain that the agent's longer legs would ensure that the subsequent chase would be brief and humiliating. Miles hefted the battering ram, carefully lining up its rim with the inscribed circle, and was about to push the red button on the hilt when Beckett asked, Brother, you know I don't usually worry about stuff like danger, but should we be standing under this ginormous building? Miles smiled. Do not fret, Beck. This is the safest place to be. Specialist Heights giggled. She couldn't help it. This entire scenario was so outlandish that it couldn't possibly be happening. She had heard tales about Artemis Fowl and his exploits with the LEP, but no one in the Academy actually believed them. Not word for word. The people loved to embellish, and Lazuli always thought the Fowl stories were simply not very convincing exaggerations. But now, she was standing under a building with a child who was determined to demolish it with a tube of metal. Miles arched one of the eyebrows that, for some reason, Clippers had neglected to shave. Is that a problem, Specialist? He asked. Oh no, said Lazuli. Go ahead and knock down a huge solid building with a metal pipe. Miles scowled, one of his default expressions. Most people scowl perhaps twice a week, but he spent a large portion of his day with his features twisted in displeasure. This was his lot as a misunderstood genius. I'm not going to knock down the building, he said. I'm going to dismantle it. And with the kind of flair he'd always claimed to despise, Miles Fowl pressed the red button and activated the charge in the battering ram's base, which sent a metal column thumping into the Institute's undercarriage with a force of 2,000 newtons, which is a piddling amount in the grand scheme of things. And nothing happened. Hmm, said Nani. It seems as though I have learned how to be self-satisfied. So, Miles, can I say I told you so? Wait, said Miles, unperturbed by the seemingly abject failure of his experiment. These things take time. Not too much time, was the general hope, as time was not a luxury they possessed at the moment. I should have done it, said Beckett, sulking now. You know I break things better than you. Not breaking, brother, said Miles. Deconstructing. And, as if to punctuate his claim, there came a crack from deep inside the building like a single nervous peal of thunder, and the enormous top section of the Eye Film Museum, with hardly any ado, separated from the plinth, and megatons of concrete, steel, and glass slid into the harbor. It took perhaps 12 seconds from start to finish, and it made about as much noise as a semi-truck driving along a gravel driveway. The Regrettables were showered with a fine dust, but otherwise completely unaffected. The museum, because of its streamlined shape, cleaved the water, raising not enough of a wick to capsize the child's dinghy. It was, as a debris shipyard worker witness later observed, reminiscent of a controlled launch, as the Eye Film Museum was always meant to be a super yacht, albeit one that sunk almost immediately, forming a new dam that blocked the harbor, effectively cutting off the acronym agent's pursuit. There said Miles with some satisfaction, as if he had just managed to open a stubborn jar. That should do the trick for the moment. Beckett stood in slack-jawed wonder at the destruction his brother had wrought. Destruction that was at once devastating and precise, on a scale he could only dream of, and all without hurting a single soul. Miles, he said, I'm prepared to admit now that sometimes brains are good. It's about time, said Miles, and they bumped wrists. <laughs>